Check, check, check. All right, I have to be kind of quiet, but you know this. This is a dad-hosted show, as half of the hosts are dads as of the last few days. So congrats to one of our own, Jed Payne and Georgia Frederick, for the birth of their daughter, Ruth Eleanor Payne. A big old congrats. And hell yeah. So this episode is quite meaningful to me. Eight years ago, I started this podcast with episode one, Can a Christian Be a Universalist? I was what you'd call a hopeful one at the time, which basically means I sure hope God saves everyone. But I was doubtful. But let me step back. This podcast has always been called Pastor With No Answers, which has never meant that I don't think I have answers to anything. That would mean that I haven't learned anything in life and is a slap in the face to a God who has graced me with such great learning through my life. But what this title has always represented, I still hold to. I don't know most stuff when it comes to the spiritual. In fact, I'd say I'm not certain about anything. 99% is about all I have for anything, but I have tons of faith. And what has happened in these last eight years is also a real time example of what this podcast and its title has represented over the years. What I found back then to be a very unlikely eschatological, eschatological, (laughs) what I found then to be a very unlikely possibility with eschatology and very little evidence for in the Bible I now in 2023 truly believe Christian universalism is the most likely outcome and that most of scripture would point to that. And I could be wrong, but there's a switch that has gone off in me. I've seen something I can't unsee. I believe it's the Holy Spirit. Ironically, many Christians would think an evil spirit. And that right there, let me say this. I'm I'm not here to convince you of my view, but this is the only thing I really would like to obliterate from the church. And that is a label of heresy concerning this view, because after you listen to this episode, I'd find it shocking if you didn't have to reconsider that label and is at the very least a possible outcome as to how all this shakes out. I'm a Christian which means I believe Jesus is the main guy, the way to the Father, God himself. I believe that he rose. Stop right there. Doesn't that right there make me a Christian and your brother in Christ? Don't we get to now say after that point, sweet, now that we have that established, let's love one another, take care of our neighbors together, take hope in our Lord, and along the way, we can talk about this other stuff. And I'll say emphatically, this view, which is certainly mine, does belong on the table of discussion within the church. Now, most of you would disagree, but we both call Jesus Lord. We both are trying to live out the gospel, and I love you. So will you hear me out? And will you listen to my new friend? He's a reverend in the Methodist church and has laid out thoroughly, including scripturally, why Christian universalism rooted in Jesus isn't outlandish and why him and I have landed to believe it's most likely. Is Derek Ryan Kabilis on his book, Holy Hell, A Case Against Eternal Damnation. Love you all. Love the fact that many of us have been on a journey together for eight years. Many of us still don't agree with each other, but we sure as heck love listening and learning more of other views. So thanks to my patrons for helping me do this. We'll be talking lots more about this view in our online community. I'll have a video of this conversation for your viewing. And we'll also have a Q&A here soon where you can join the guests you're about to hear. We'll even bring Chip Judd as a contrarian. I haven't asked him if he would do it, but I kind of know that he would. He likes this sort of thing. It's Derek Ryan Kabilis. I like demanded, pleaded, called God on promises and was like, you have to show up or like I am done. And he did. And he did. 
That's something yep. to really think about. What does it mean that the God of the universe loves me? Are we saying that our God is bigger than their God or what? Man, you got my mind going crazy right now. I just think that that is evangelical bullshit. And I don't fit in their box anymore. So feeling rejected from the church makes me feel far away from God. If I'm living out the love of God, love of the divine, then in some ways we're unoffendable. It's wrong to marginalize anybody for any reason. Sometimes we we can just have some things about our perspective that's off until we encounter someone who can challenge our thoughts, have conversations with us, and we just continue to grow and evolve. I, I got him with you there. Uh, yeah, I like that. That sounded like womp, 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 womp to Rob. I'm a hardcore gospel lover. I do love the gospel. I just think we get it wrong. Girl, I was so highly medicated. I don't even know if you <laughs> Oh, God, my people. All right, so I, I'm going to try it. It's Derek Kabilis. Yes. Boom. Boom. And it. and is it pastor, reverend, father? Uh, yeah. It, oddly, my church calls me vicar. It's a very vicar. long story. <laughs> is that unique to you? Is that unique yeah, to you? Yeah, it's very okay. unique to me. Not in Methodist history, but at this particular point in time. It started as a joke years ago. And it's kind of kept up with every church that I've gone gotcha. to. Gotcha. So. Nice. Vicar? Yep. Vicar. You got it. <laughs> Do I have that privilege? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You're absolutely. like, hell yeah. <laughs> hey, well, let me, I, I, I obviously want to get a background on you, but I think for this conversation, you having kind of a snapshot of me. So the very first, I started this podcast in 2015. It was kind of a outgrowth of a podcast I started way back in the day called Bad Christian. And mm -hmm. the very first episode on Pastor With No Answers was, can a Christian be a universalist? And I haven't gone oh. back and listened, listened in a long time, but I can almost guarantee you that my thoughts on it then would have been I'm very, I, I'm hopeful, but doubtful because it just doesn't seem to be too much evidence. So oh. fast forward a little bit. And I talked to Chris uh, Date. He is a host of Rethinking Hell podcast. And he blew my world up when he basically showed in, in you know, in very Chris Date fashion, he showed the details and the evidence for why annihilationism is true. And I was like, if I could be believing oh, okay. eternal conscious torment, torment, for as long as I have, and then I hear a biblical case that just completely refutes everything I ever thought, it just opened the door for further thinking. And um, before I tell you where I was at before reading uh, this unbelievable book, you know, I had the background of repenting after lunch because I didn't witness to an, enough people. And I thought that if I died right then and there, I would go to hell. So I was, you know, repenting. I resonated so much with one of your stories because I did this to my wife and it was with good intent, but her, she finds out that her father probably has a week to live. Her father lives in Indiana. Mm, and so nice. she is battling the thoughts of I'm going to lose my dad. And dude, I, I asked her if she's ready to make sure he's saved. And, mm. and it, it came out of a heart of love. Yeah, like I, I yeah. just didn't want to see her dad be lost forever. Uh, but before reading your book, I was at a place to where I can't, I can't unsee what I see now. And I think that you're as far as Jesus saving everyone. And I think that your, your book, uh, it's, I know it wasn't intended this way, but it seems almost like an apologetics book, but you are not systematizing theology and you make it very no, clear no. that you are not you know, standing as this, Hey, here's the truth. But it does feel for someone who like me, who doesn't have all the studying and thorough research mm. and, and all of that, it, it feels like a handbook. Like you've answered all the questions, like mm. <laughs> you've addressed all the scriptures. And I'm telling you, man, it, it was a, it was a powerful, powerful reading experience. So I just oh, want to thank, thank you. you. I just really want to thank you. Uh, um, I mean this this will get <laughs> this will get a little emotional, man. Like I after yeah. after finishing your book, I went into each of my four kids' rooms, and that's uh, obviously when you're a parent, and they're they're all sleeping. When you're a parent, you're you're 
your fear used to be yourself going to hell forever. And then mm-hmm. you're thinking, no, the worst fear is thinking of my kid, not accepting Absolutely. God and going to hell forever. And I went into all of their bedrooms and, you know, a 17, 15, 13 and 11. And I kissed them. And it was the first time where I feel like I truly accepted mm. my kids are going to be OK, because if I if I love them this much and God even loves them just a hair bit more, they're good. Like they're going to be totally fine. And so I, I really do want to start. Oh, you're going to make off. me cry now. <laughs> Golly. Thank you so much. And I, I'm curious what's your journey. Like, give us a snapshot of, of you and your faith background. And dude, I'm going to try to fit so many questions in, in an hour. Oh, I think you're going to, cool. you're going to be impressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, my faith. Well, first of all, let me just say, you're absolutely right. That it, that the book is not like a systematic approach. Mm-hmm. I try to address all the major issues around hell and eternal torment and that kind of stuff. But ultimately it's about giving people permission to have that kind of hope. You know what I'm saying? It's about like taking out some of those roadblocks for people that if, if they see what I see in the Bible, then I want them to be free to embrace um, the hope that they have not only for themselves, but for their family and for the whole world. Um, I have been a United Methodist basically my whole life. There was a time when I was questioning things when I was in college, but eventually I just came back to, uh, to Wesley and to the Methodist world. And I, um, now are you, I, are you accepted in the official ranks of, of the Methodist church with, with yes. your belief? Okay. Um, no one has made a big deal out of it. We don't have much doctrine okay. about hell specifically. Like we don't spend much time on it. It doesn't come up very much, which is where I think a lot of people are, both in mainline churches and in evangelical churches, you spend so much time talking about Jesus that the whole hell thing just kind of sits in the background somewhere as this like ugly thing that no one really wants to talk about. And so if anything, I hope my book can contribute to starting the conversation in the Methodist world about what do we actually think about hell and why? Um, those kinds of things. Yeah. So, yeah. And just for a feel, give us, uh, w- would you say when it comes to your belief that, and, and we'll, we'll get into w- the facets of it, but your belief that Jesus saves everyone, would you put that on a zero to 50% chance, 50 to 75% chance or 75 to a hundred where you're at right now in your personal belief? Oh, 75 to a hundred. 75 to a hundred. Yeah. I, I don't see... Um, if, if everything Jesus had to tell us about who God is, is true, Mm -hmm. then it is almost impossible from a philosophical perspective to embrace a hell of eternal torment or even an annihilation of the soul. Um, and from a biblical perspective, I just can't see the, the case being there anymore. Yeah. 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 And I, one thing that is, is very striking to me is, is reading your book and then talking to and reading. Uh, there's a woman who wrote Raising Hell and her name is uh, Sharon Putt. And it's just so interesting that there are little details and additions to why the three of us believe how we believe. And I've never talked to you before and reading your book. I'm like, you so first and foremost, you articulated things way deeper and wider and better than me. But there's some of the stuff in there. I'm like, exactly. That's like you are saying. And and I really, as a spiritual person, I really do believe that it's some work of the Holy Spirit that's kind of mm-hmm. opening every, you know, some people's eyes to like, wait a second. And, and here and the big one for me, and I think they were pretty close in your book was, was Jesus just playing around when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing? Or was, Absolutely. He based, or, or was he saying, hey, I want them forgiven because they they didn't know what they're doing. Like they're they're yeah. We know, Father, we know what they're made of. Yeah. And and the second one was how 
dare God tells us to love our enemies and then in the long run he doesn't love his yeah it 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 really does um cause a kind of uh it's like breaking the dam yeah the flood comes in um there are two things about that number one is father forgive them for they know not what they do you don't even have to go that far just start with father right that if jesus comes to reveal that god is father um mother parent however you need to articulate that to yourself that god is this loving relation to us who by definition has only our best intentions at heart and in mind yeah um it's very hard to imagine that that any fa- I, I I tell this story, like imagine that you are growing up in a really great childhood and your parents love you. They read you bedtime stories. They go to t-ball or volleyball practice or whatever it is. They put your art on their refrigerator. They love you deeply. And then when you get to college, you find out that that whole time, Secretly, they had a dungeon in their basement. And that after they read you your bedtime story and helped you say your prayers, they went downstairs and immediately started torturing other brothers and sisters you didn't even know you had while you slept. That is analogous to the way we've been thinking about God. Yeah, it really um, is. And there's no escaping it anymore for me. Like I said, I can't unsee it. You're, yeah, you're right. once once you see it, it's very hard to turn back from it. And it causes uh, a reevaluation of a lot of things. And the number one thing that people, very few people have read the book. Those who have, because it doesn't come out till February, mm-hmm. But for those who have read it, the number one thing they say is part of me felt this way the whole time and I just didn't have access to it. I just couldn't let that that breathe. So I feel like for a lot of people, even though they may have never heard like the intricacies of purgatorial universalism or explanations about the Greek word Ionios, whatever this is something that is living in people's guts long before someone like me comes around and tells them about it yeah and i and i wish that i could have or i wish that i could include myself in those people because i think that you're right but man my my life i mean i i have i've gone through therapy Mm. because of this because when I heard heaven and hell, it, that was that was real life in the moment, mm-hmm. unshakable. And if the stakes are that high, first of all, how can I guarantee that I'm not going to go there? And we all know faith doesn't work that way. Like there was no yeah. way that yeah. I was going to get exactly. And so I was torturing myself. I was torturing myself for not witnessing enough. I mean, mm. you know, had to. <laughs> work and you could that never aspect. witness enough. Right. That's my point in the book, that if you ever witnessed enough to be in proportion with the stakes exactly. that are involved, uh, you would be homeless, you would never get married, you would never have children, you would never go to the movies. Like, it would be an all-encompassing thing, because 80, 90 years is not very long, especially compared with eternity. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you this. So you you are the I think you're the rule when it comes to talking about hell in this way. And I and I've had so many people say this and it hasn't been my experience. And I'm curious if you think that I'm kind of like an exception to the role, but rule. But even though I grew up in churches where the theology was harmful just because I was scared to death of hell, I never felt like either one of those churches. So uh, most of my time was in two different Pentecostal churches and I grew up as a kid as Catholic. So how go figure that one. Mm-hmm. But in those two church, those two Pentecostal churches, 
uh, I don't feel like anyone was telling me about hell and teaching me about hell so that me and my parents and my grandparents would pay, stay and 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 be more committed. Like I really yeah. did feel like it never was a tool of fear. And that man drives me crazy to think that leaders are are pivoting hell to scare people. That's never been my experience. And I, I hear that all the time. Yeah, so it has no, to be the norm. I don't think most pastors and religious leaders are so cynical that they understand that they are peddling this um, trauma inducing theological idea for the sake of keeping their churches afloat in keeping the money coming in. There are some, um, but it's by no means even close to being a majority. I think for a lot of people, this is what they were raised with and this is how it came about. And I think it's emergent. I think when I, I think over the 2000 year history of the church, it's reasonable to think that some pastors turned to hell instinctively when they saw their numbers decreasing, when they saw people's uh. faithfulness kind of um, uh, wavering in some kind of identifiable way. And so by instinct, I think they turn to things like hell or, you know, God's judgment as a way of kind of shepherding people back. Right. Yeah. I just think that's an inappropriate thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I, I know I, I wonder if this, if this is true, what sort of sovereign plan was it that God just didn't make sure we all knew? I mean, just just imagine if somehow it could have been clearer. And it's it seems like it's this. I mean, here here we were. First of all, you know, back in the day, and I mean, still it's it's happening in some places. But we slaughter people for not sharing the same faith, and that and that was the mm -hmm. church as well. And I thought about you know all the all the crap that seeker friendly churches have gotten over the years, and I'm sure some uh, some of them have gone awry and they don't have their uh, priorities straight, just like you know any denomination. But what if that was a step further into the revelation of God's ultimate universal love that, hey, people don't feel loved when we're slamming hell in their face all the time. Like that just doesn't mm. work. That doesn't, there's something that just doesn't feel right about that because mm. I know people who have started churches, they barely talk about hell. And if you ask them what they believe, they believe in hell. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. But it's, oh, yeah. it feels almost like that was a part of the process of, because you know, when, now when we talk about fire and brimstone churches, most people's context is, yeah, mom and dads or grandma and grandpas, you know, mm -hmm. seems like a long revelation. Though, Have you ever thought, man, if this is true, Jesus, why wouldn't you have just said it so clearly? Hey, <laughs> hear ye, hear ye. <laughs> Every single living person that ever takes a breath, no matter what race, no matter what sexual orientation, no matter what country, it does not matter what religion. I am saving the day. That like that's a really why? great question. That's a really good question. <laughs> I think um I think that clarity is there. It has been obscured um yeah, wow. with our translation and our approach, our hermeneutics, um, just the way we interpret it. I think the moment the word Abba fell from his lips, that message should have been incredibly clear. Yeah. Um, there is a place where it's interesting. Um, John Chrysostom seems to indicate that he has this kind of belief all the way back in, you know, the fourth century, but that humanity might not be ready for it quote unquote. And I don't even know what that means. Like I'm always ready for some good news. I'm always right, ready for right. hope, you know, but even when Paul, Paul uses the word apocatastasis speaks to this, this final kind of reconstitution of all things in Christ. Um, 
there's a lot that is really blatant in the New Testament, but it has been clouded over by so many centuries of fear and anxiety inducing theology that it's just really hard for us to see. Yeah. Now. Well, and, and here, here's my experience. And I would assume that a lot of people could relate to this is I was, I was taught things about heaven and hell before I started studying the Bible. So I had already taken that in as that's just the truth. Like that's about as fundamental of a truth as you can get. So when I read these now I see as very obscure passages where we're making connecting so many dots that do not need to be connected. Back then I read that as, oh, yeah, that that confirms everything I've already been Mm -hmm. told. I know what Jesus is talking about. When I read yeah. Paul saying in Adam, we all die in Christ, we shall all be made alive. Well, that can't that can't mean all because I already yeah. know about hell, <laughs> you know, and I've thought before, how would I have approached the Bible if someone had told me, hey, this God that we serve saves everybody like in the end, everything yeah. is fine. Everybody's going to be together. I would have approached the Bible and been like, I don't know what Jesus is talking about with the sheep and goats, but I know it doesn't mean that goats are going to be burned forever because I've already been taught that God, you know, it really is what we were taught before we even approached the Bible. I think, gosh, uh, a Sunday school class for children from a universalist perspective could change the world. Um, Because even you don't even have to go to church. We learn what hell is just from the cultural residue that's out there in the world. You know that it's painful, that it lasts forever, that there's no hope, all of these things. And then when when that becomes your starting point for biblical interpretation, you have to say, well, all can't mean all, I guess, you know, or God's love just isn't that big. Whoa, or I don't like there that has, one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that's what we're talking about, right, right? Right. Like that God gives up on people. Yeah. My whole argument is that God just doesn't give up on us. That death is not just some arbitrary cut off deadline. See, that's another that's another one of those things. Exactly how you articulated that. I've been saying that recently when I've been talking theology with people. I'm just like, like, please help me understand what is it about? What's so important about the human physical body that when that dies, time's up? Yeah. Like, yeah. what in the hell are you talking? Like, how can that make sense? Like, what? What is it about the human body that that's the cutoff point? And that's exact. I was just like, oh, my gosh, this. So, I mean, you 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 confirmed all of these metaphors that I've been thinking, but then added like a hundred thousand. I keep interrupting you. So I don't even know. Oh, no, you're cool. um, You know, when I so I'll tell our listeners that we're I can only spend uh, so much time on different things. I will say that I'm not going to go too much into theology. I'll just I'll, I'll say that, Derek, it is it's a it's comprehensive. So if you want to understand why there's people like me and uh, Derek who believe that everybody is going to be saved in the end, then it's, you know, r- read through, like read, yeah. just, <laughs> check it out for yourself sort of thing. Um, but what I don't understand is how anyone like anyone could say heresy after actually reading a book like this and i'm curious Mm. like do you think or or let me put it this way what do you think people would say after reading your book like and still want to dismiss it completely because at the at the very least it should be on the table of discussion like once you once you read the verses and you see how many they are and these are clear you know the ones that people are banking eternal torment those are fuzzy. The ones that talk about oh, yeah. everybody being saved, those those are, you know, those are clear. I, what would people I, say? What would my people list say isn't even exhaustive. Um, like you use the the word comprehensive, there are people who give a much more comprehensive view than I do, even. Um, but they write from a more scholastic point of view. I think um, I don't know how people will receive it. And I don't know if they will cry heresy. I know they've cried heresy for a long time about it because this belief has always been with the church. It has always been there. 
Um, there have always been Christians that believed this. I yeah. think what I hope someone who comes from that perspective walks away from my book thinking is that um, they didn't have such a grasp on the truth of eternal torment than they thought. Right. I hope it causes a doubt. I hope they walk away with a limp and I hope it continues. They've been, you know, everyone is haunted by hell. I hope some people become haunted by universalism yeah. and it becomes something that they just can't shake. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The, the, the one theology deal that I wanted to bring up because I had never heard it articulated this way. Like I, in, in fact, I would say, I was maybe maybe starting to think about this concept, but I didn't know how to put it into words. And you said that, uh, and I these aren't I don't think you're, these are your exact words, but an honor worthy God demands uh, for either God to die or for all of us to be eternal punished, and God is bound to this. And you ask the question: sh Then should we worship? those confinements that God is in. Like if God has to operate yeah. this way, then that means that God has to yield to something. And I just love how you said, okay, well then who's God? <laughs> yeah. And so I, I was talking about Anselm so much of the way so many Christians today, especially in the evangelical world, think about salvation it comes from uh, this guy Anselm who said that, you know, God is honor bound to punish sin one way or another. Either you punish the sinner themselves, or, you know, he created this substitute, which is where we get the word substitutionary atonement in Jesus Christ, who can take away the sin for everybody who's big enough because he himself is God, that his sacrifice can satisfy the honor that God must maintain. And my point is, okay, we should just be honoring, we should be worshiping that honor. That there, right. whatever it is that God has to do, whatever orders God has to follow, we should be worshiping that instead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because that's the stronger of the two. Yeah. I think the, the point and even when you when you look at a beautiful passage like the Philippians 2 Christ him um that Christ did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited but emptied himself taking on the form of a slave it's not about honor for Jesus it's not about justice it's not about everyone getting their recompense and making sure all the accounts line up and the ledger is balanced at the end of the day, it's about love. It yeah. is about an inexhaustible, um, unstoppable love that God has for each of us. And on a long enough timeline, that love will reign victorious. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so most of what I want to spend the rest of this conversation with is is broken into two categories. One mm -hmm. uh, one is uh, if if things are how I traditionally believe, then it's just blatant unfairness, and I'll, I'll get more into that mm -hmm. and uh, pick your brain about that and give some of the examples that that you gave in the book. But then also, it just doesn't make sense. Like what you're telling me is is like you're you're trying to make sense out of all powerful and all loving and then you're trying to tell me that most people are separated from forever it just doesn't make sense it's not lining up mm. anymore but uh some things that you said just made my jaw drop and this was one of them is that if god gives you a choice to love god and you choose not to and he punishes you that's an abuser like yeah anybody yeah. on the face of the earth if 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 i went up to a woman and said you have to love me. She would say, no, I don't. And leave me alone. And I captured her and punished her for not loving me. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'd probably get the electric chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I love what you and, and lay this out for people. I think that the dots would probably connect right when I say it, but you likened uh, a, a, 
and I don't know if you use the terminology financial privilege, but people are born into situations that are ahead of other people. They have benefits that other people don't have. And it's the same sort of thing with spirituality. We're not oh, we're not absolutely. all born at the starting line. I was born into a family of faith that made sure that I went to church every Sunday. I had really competent ministers growing up who did not abuse me either physically or emotionally. I had people who loved me in Sunday school and I had the money to go to seminary and learn all these wonderful things about Jesus. Most people don't have that, right? Um, most people in the world throughout all of history have not had those same kinds of privileges that make a relationship with God seem like something wonderful, seem like something that they want to have, um, that make the Christian God seem like a God with whom they should be in a very intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you were um, on the the radar of the Crusaders as they marched down to the Holy Land, and these Christian soldiers burned your entire town, um, maybe stole all your stuff, maybe raped some of your women, what's that going to do for how you perceive God? Right. Um, or in our time, my friend Sarah Stancorb Taylor has done all this amazing work about um, uh, ministers who uh, abuse people in their congregations and the way that churches try to safeguard the ministers and not believe the women. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you were abused as a child by a religious leader. Um, you wouldn't. You might not want anything to do with God. And you it would be. And, and I think you pointed out. I'm pretty sure you said it would be bad for your mental health. Like absolutely. How, how do you work that one out? It's just if like you, this is if, harmful for your mental health, but you got to figure it out. You got dude, to. If you have been been um, traumatized by a priest or a minister, this minister right here is telling you you have my permission to never set foot in a church again. Right. Um, you have my permission to never use the word Jesus if you don't want to, because you've been hurt. You know, I, I uh, lost my leg in the year 2012. Um, I, I have I had oh, a man. congenital problem yep. and all of that, but that helped me learn a few lessons about accommodation right? And my wife has ADHD. And since we've gotten married, I've had to learn about how to accommodate her. And she's had to learn how to accommodate me with my leg. There are people that have traumatic experiences from church and God will accommodate them. If we can learn the lessons of accommodation, then how much more can God learn them? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. So you got all these good analogies. Listen to mine. So mm. I, I I thought the deceiver. So let's, let's just say, you know, Satan is the bully yeah. and big brother. I got a big brother, though, and my big brother is God. So he's got my back. He loves mm -hmm. me. And he's like so influential at, at school and all the cool kids and whatever. Like he could completely keep me from being deceived by any bad guys because i love my brother mm -hmm. and uh and this big brother totally just ignores watching me be deceived watching me get taken advantage of uh, a, a priest and turning my back on god seeing all that mm -hmm. stuff happen knowing that the cost is eternity just not doing anything about it like that'd be a yeah. sucky big brother that's a yeah. bad big brother <laughs> yeah that's good that's, and right, then well, allowed you and then the difference though is that also like your big brother is then the one who's actually punishing you right like the one who's actually causing the damage to happen right um yeah it, it becomes ridiculous at a certain point of view yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, so we we talked a, a couple of things already in the doesn't make sense category, but it doesn't mm -hmm. make sense for Jesus to say, "Father, forgive them." It doesn't make sense that we've been told to to love our 
enemies. Here's one thing, and I, I don't know if you've heard this reservation when it comes to how you and I are talking. Like there's dear friends of mine who I respect, they respect me. And if they heard the way that we were talking, they'd say, you guys keep putting what you think your definition of love looks like and attributing that to infinite God. Like you can't put your human definitions on God. And the what I think immediately is the same person sees the Bible as completely inerrant, infallible, and you're not going to read First Corinthians 13. Just start mm-hmm. there if you want to see what yeah. God's love looks like. Love like, keeps no record of wrongs. Right. We're not like. setting the definition. <laughs> we're, we're pointing yeah. to what God is saying is love. Yeah, that's. Do you hear that a lot? Do you hear people say that? Well, come on, Derek. Yeah, people analogies. You know, that's not the the one thing that people always want to say, and it's kind of like a pseudo philosophical thing, is that oh, you have to balance God's love with God's justice. Have you heard that one before? I, I that's the one that I hear more than anything, and it's like the hell you do, right? Like, why is that a rule? (laughs) Like, what is it about the gospel that is, in fact, just? Right. Um, That if Jesus died to save me, and I know how bad I am, um, then that tells me right away that justice is not God's ultimate sort of um, trophy in all of this. God is looking to save God's children. And that is not something at which God will allow God's self to fail. Yeah. Um, that is a, a journey that he will continue even in, in there. In, in, so one of the points that I make in my book is that there may very well be some kind of pain waiting for some of us, if not all of us on the other side of the grave, um, there might be something that hurts, but whatever that thing is, it will be rehabilitative. It will be for our own good. It will be an expression of love that seeks uh, our good and our salvation rather than pointless torment in destruction right like you and and you talked about how a, a good parent when we punish when we inflict pain by taking away p- car privileges or or spanking yeah. them or whatever the case is it's because we love them and we want it to benefit mm-hmm. them and you pointed out that if there's eternal separation there it's just pain for the sake of pain there's no good coming out of this and i love yeah. that and i love that you proposed how long can God withhold love from any person and then still be called a God of love? Like, I love that question. I mean, it's yeah. just like, how? <laughs> it, the, the idea is, is that um, God will do whatever God has to do um, in order to bring us all back into the fold. Even in, in my mind, even to the point of including that bully you spoke of, um, I think there is a case to be made, even from the book of Revelation itself, that there is a salvation, a kind of salvation that is waiting for Satan and his demons, which, however you want to define that, um, which is probably the most controversial claim right. I make in the book. Um, well, I, I mean, personally, I, I I would be hopeful for any any intelligent, conscious being. I, I mean, even Satan. I mean, why? <laughs> Why wouldn't I want to see the greatest redemption story of all time? It's not like God is, yeah. you know, and you make clear, not maybe not in this particular instance, but you can apply, you make clear, it's not like God and Satan are going to give this high five at the end of all things <laughs> and be like, well, we're friends again. And you, talk, and you talked about fire and brimstone is, is actually a purifier, right? Back in the Absolutely. day. Absolutely. Like so every time we hear fire and brimstone and we all have the blood curdling deal and just mm-hmm. like, oh, that's going to be the most horrible thing. You're, you're saying that it's basically talking about it, it could be painful, but it's to purify us throughout all eternity and we're good to go. Absolutely. The, even in, in Revelation, the, the lake of fire, 
when you actually read it in Greek, it's not a lake. It is a pool, a smelting pool. It's a reference to this refinement of silver, that, that this is the process by which all the dross is burned away, all the impurity, all that is gross and harmful gets taken out and all that's left is what's good. Yeah. So Derek, before we move on to something else, you got to give people the, the cruise analogy. I thought that was, <laughs> give us the cruise, man. I'm glad you didn't bring up the dog one. Cause that one's hard. Oh, um, I act, that, that was going to be my last one. Because, <laughs> oh, okay. And, okay. and the, the reason being is that this, this fallacy that God just has yeah. to give us free will and what that free will looks like just letting us do aimlessly. Yeah. Why, why, why don't we do that one right now? You want to do the dog one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you'd rather not, Hey, let's no, I tell you what, it's cool. I, I cool. what, I just dipped my toe in it. I got people interested. They have to read the book for the dog one. Go ahead and give us the cruise one. <laughs> yeah. Day. The dog, the dog story was hard for me to write and is very hard to read as a dog lover, but it, it tries to make clear uh, just how much of a villain we're turning God into when we say that God punishes people forever and ever. Yeah, yeah. Um, the boat story. Hey, uh, real, real quick. Yeah, and uh, the the dog analogy that I was talking about because I do remember the one you just said is you you explained how we have this narrative that for God to be loving and respectful to us, he oh. has to give us complete free will, Yeah, no, which, which, yeah. Would, which would also include us being deceived, having the, the, this horrible world that, you know, eats people alive, having that effect, just letting us be influenced by all these bad things and hard hearts. And, and, and that's the sort of free will that we have to be given and you said how a dog owner, if they were to give mm-hmm. their dogs complete free reign out in the front yard where they can just go and leave, they can get hit by a car. That's not freedom. Lost. That's not freedom. That's I, I was talking about my dog Beowulf. Yeah. And I said, you know, I keep him on a chain because I love him. I drag him to the vet because I love him. He doesn't want to go, but I do it anyway. I'm a I'm a Methodist. Methodists are the ones who take free will more seriously than any other denomination. (laughs) Okay. But even I have to admit free will is not um, infinite. Okay. The same way that you would not give your children the freedom to make choices that could kill them. You wouldn't give your dog freedom to go wander in the street and eat trash and get hit by a car. God does not, God gives us freedom, but not the kind of freedom that would lead to our ultimate destruction. And if God did do that, then God would be a terrible parent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, that's the second dog story. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. The, the boat story is all about um, what you spoke about, the trauma that people undergo for not evangelizing enough, not witnessing enough, not bringing people and not, not working hard enough to, to bring people into the fold. And my argument is that when you're talking about an eternal destiny, when you are talking on time scales of infinity, that makes no sense. So let's say I'm on a cruise and uh, I've been saving up for this cruise for a long time. I've never gone on a cruise before, and I'm really enjoying myself. I'm out on the deck by myself, sipping my drink, and I see a child fall over the railing of the cruise. I have a choice to make in that moment. I could take a little bit of time to throw a life preserver out to the child. But then, of course, I would have to... uh take the time to bring her back in. I would have to press an alarm. Yeah, it's a hassle. I mean, there would be on. an investigation. <laughs> People would ask me. I'd, I'd have to talk to the parents. You're looking at hours of my my two-week cruise right. that's just gone. No, I think I'm just going to sit here and sip my drink, right? I think I'm just going to, whatever happens to her, happens to her. It's fine. If If we lived in a world 
where people were constantly falling into an abyss of eternal damnation. And we didn't work full time, more than full time, 120 hours a week, evangelizing, preaching, you know, taking people down the Romans road, whatever. It would be akin to not taking 10 minutes out of a two week long vacation to rescue a child. Yeah. Um, yet we don't, we don't do that. We go to the movies, we drink coffee, um, we uh, garden, we do these things because there is something inside of us that tells us everything is going to be okay. You don't have to drive yourself crazy evangelizing. Yeah. You don't have to put this strain on your relationships and show up at people's deathbeds and ask them, you know, if they're saved or not. None of that is necessary because everything is going to be okay in the end. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if, all, you know, my, my whole life, I could just tell you I, so many people that I've worried about being in hell once they passed away or why it, while I'm in life with them, you know, not seeing their lives ever uh, you know, go in yeah. that direction. I mean, just, just all that sort of thing. And I, I feel like it's not that like, I, I don't know if it is because of the circles that I was in, but it was impossible for me to have that feeling. And I wonder if all of these people I've observed as a kid thinking those are the people that are going to hell. I wonder if they had that that piece mm. of everything's going to be okay because it was never clouded by these dogmas that people were actually saying, no, this is it. I couldn't hear from God. I mean, yeah. it's, like I'm, I'm supposed to be hearing from God through these people. Mm. Like that's how, that's how I'm taught the, the, Hey, they're teaching you about God. And so for me, it, it wasn't about, I don't believe this. It, it, when it comes to hell, I had to suppress it. Like I just to be yeah. sane, I had to push it way back there. And when, when it wasn't pushed back there, it was too hard for me to handle. Like I, I it, it contributed to depression, anxiety. Absolutely. I think that it had, to, even though I've been over a lot of this stuff, I think it contributed to a mental health crisis I had in 2019. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, this was toxic, toxic stuff. And, uh, and, and then here's the thing. If it's true, it's worth being toxic. It's it's worth Absolutely. scaring us shitless. It's worth yeah. doing whatever you can. If you want to ruin someone's life over the fear of hell and they go to heaven because of it, okay, sign me up for that. I'll do that for yeah. everybody. <laughs> and here's the thing. If it's true, um, probably the least moral thing you ever did in your entire life was have children. Exactly. Yeah. That you brought souls into the world that were capable of experiencing eternal damnation because there's nothing you can do to guarantee that they won't do that. Right. Um, if, if Christians, my, my whole point in the book is at that deepest possible level, most of us do not believe in an eternal conscious torment to that extent, because if we did, that would be part of our culture. Yeah. We would, we would be like the shakers. We wouldn't have children. Um, and Christianity would have died out a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, so when you, when you start talking about these things on, on infinite scales, it gets really crazy, really fast, which is one of the reasons, which I think is one of the reasons why we don't talk about it more because it doesn't really stand up to strict scrutiny. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, I, I really love how you talked about it. It really helped me because I'm, I'm surrounded mostly by either people that don't really believe in Christian lenses at all or yeah. Christians who certainly believe that unfortunately people are going to be separated from, from God. And I love near the end, you, you talk specifically to people like me on, I don't have to go around with this megaphone trying to wake people up like, no. Hey, God saves everybody. Just, just chill. Let's focus on physical needs. We don't have to, you know, we can share the love of the gospel, but we don't have to be obsessed with whether or not they, uh, you know, accept that. Like I can, I can, 
if I were to do that, then all of a sudden I would throw a wedge between me and most people because they'd be like, what are you even talking about? However, Mm -hmm. if I'm in this culture with people that love me and I love them and we can have conversations behind the scenes, which they have already happened, that's a completely different story. And, and, you know, these, so it it was very helpful for me to read how you're just like, it doesn't have to be something that you have to rush. It doesn't have to be something that you have to feel like you really have to set it afire. But mm-hmm. I wanted to bring up to you is you said that uh, the only instance where you would be emphatic with proclaiming this would be at someone's deathbed where yeah. the family needs peace and, and all of that. And, you know, what's ironic is there would be some people who are so systematized in their theology. And I, now I believe that if it was a, you know, a parent to a child or a spouse to a, a spouse, they would, you know, certainly not want to, um, you know, believe this and anything peaceful that you would give them, they'd probably Mm. grab hold of it. But maybe uncle, uncle Johnny, Mm. who's been seeped Mm. in fundamentalism here, a pastor come in knowing Mm. damn well, that kid never gave his heart to Christ. (laughs) And pastor, you're going to come in here with all this lion, hooey gooey, you know, bullshit, Jesus sort of, uh, uh, theology. You could get in trouble. Like they, you know what I'm saying? Like it's just, I, it's ironic. I agree with you a hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I feel like I could say it in a way that even an evangelical who doesn't believe that way could take it in. Like I've said to people before, I think we're going to be shocked just how powerful of a salvation plan God had, you know, and that doesn't that doesn't say any sort of proclamations about universalism. I think so. What I was doing in that that section of the book, it has this this section at the end where I talk about specific, if, if you've been convinced of all this, if this is something you're into, if you're a lay person, here's some advice I have for you. And if you're a clergy person, this is some advice that I have for you. And one of the things that I, I said is don't listen, don't read this book and then start preaching sermons on universalism immediately and freak everybody out because you've destabilized the entire thing in your church. Like this, you know, your journey toward universalism took you a long time. Very long time. Right. Yeah. So did mine. And I had to be in the right place to be clear headed about it. Other people are like that too. Not everyone. I, I mean, these are hell is a very psychologically, um, captive, captivating idea. And to free people from that, it it takes time, it takes patience. But the point I was making, however, is that when someone is on their deathbed, when there is an end-of-life situation, the focus should be on the grace of God. Yeah. And it's never our place to say, well... Um, this person probably isn't going to be experiencing God's grace. We don't have any evidence that this person will be, you know, whatever. It's it's at those times when we need to be as as clear as possible about the breadth and the depth of that love that is waiting for each and every person. And if someone wants to call you on it and say, no, I think Johnny's going to hell, um, just say, okay, thank you. I really hope you don't say that to anyone in this family yeah. because they're at a really, uh, diff- they're having a difficult time right now. And that is one of the shittiest things you could possibly do. Yeah, for sure. You propose the question, what, what could the church do if hell was off the table? And that just is yeah. like, I, you know, I think about, and, and I, and I don't even think about this in a judgmental way. I believe that exactly what you, what we've been saying all along, if you believe this to be true, then you're not focusing enough on evangelism, like send more mm-hmm. teams out. Like you're mm-hmm. it's not a dime is wasted, but imagine if this is true. And if we all accepted it, we could just serve like we could just yeah you know because our our church does a heck of a job with like we do more medical mission trips than anything else and then there's construction mm-hmm. trips you know to build houses for people displaced by earthquakes and that sort of thing and then yeah. we do and then we do have a lot of evangelizing trips and i just thought man 
if this was true and the church all embraced it, we could leave out the evangelism and just kind of have that weaved in through everything by just saying, you know, the, the, the love of Jesus be upon you or, you know, tell people the, yeah. the miracle story, but you don't have to be obsessed with and, and gosh, we pray that they accept it. We just give it out while we're washing feet and taking care of the yeah. needs of people that are sick. You know, it's about rethinking what evangelism is and what its purpose is. Yeah. Like evangelism just isn't there to save souls. It's to get people started on the rehabilitation process sooner than they might otherwise be. Um, but also it it's less about, expecting something from them wanting them to say this prayer have this experience um give this fidelity over to christ in the church as if you're trying to actually extract something from them and it makes the presentation of the gospel a pure gift yeah an absolute gift that says hey you know uh this is what I believe about how big the God of love is. And this is what I believe God is trying to do in the world. This is the healing that I believe God is trying to bring. Um, and I just want to tell you about that. You don't have to respond. If you want to respond, I'll be ready and I'll be here. But really, um, I just have this message and that's why I live. Yeah. Um, it takes the pressure off and I've seen, I, in in my world, in like the mainline Christianity world, your Methodists and your Episcopalians and your Lutherans, our churches have been declining for decades. And so many people are walking around feeling sad, feeling defeated, feeling like they're letting down their community. And I know in some of their heads, in the back somewhere, there's a part of them that thinks people are going to hell because this church isn't succeeding because this church is in a quickly secularizing culture and we're not growing and we, we can't, you know, reach as many people as we would like to. Yeah. Universalism takes the pressure off yeah. and says, look, God is going to deal with, with everybody. We are the forerunners. We are Elijah crying out in the wilderness. Give your message and then let it be given and let God take care of the rest. Yeah. Yeah. And what a new meaning for his word never comes back void. Yeah. Oh my absolutely. gosh. That man, what a absolutely. new meaning of that. It's like it's not gonna come back void. They they are going to love that just as mm -hmm. much as you do at some point. Yeah. They're gonna love those words and it'll be the bread of life for them too. You 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 help me also feel and you put into words because I, I, I always felt it's just like how can I believe something so monumentally differently from my brothers and sister who I do ministry with and such a big, big difference of belief, but I feel so connected. And you said something to the effect of you, you know, you, you all believe in God. I would just be someone who believes a little bit further about God. I don't know how you articulated that, but that's so true. We all, we all, at least at my church, we all believe that God really does want everybody to be saved, but for some reason or another, it just can't happen. Like, but we believe yeah. in that God of love. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm not telling anyone to leave their churches right, right. for this reason. I don't want to see denominations split. I don't want any of that. Um, because that's just more of the same, right? That's more of what we've had, especially these last few years. Um, my thing is is that no one no one responds well when you tell someone they're wrong. Uh, the times I've responded really well to people is when they tell me I'm right, but just not right enough. These people believe that God is love. They believe that God is all loving. They believe that God is a father or a mother or a parent who cares for God's children. They believe all the pieces are in place they just haven't made this one connection yet. And there's a really good reason why we have 
centuries of tradition of people telling them that they're not allowed to make that connection. My hope for the book, Holy Hell, is that it will give people permission to put the pieces together in a way that they've secretly, um, perhaps even unconsciously, always wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this. If God is love, then Derek, you nailed it. What you wrote in the book is what, Thank you. what, what it looks like. That's what it looks like. That's very and, sweet uh, of you so to say. It is holy hell, a case against eternal damnation. And when when does this sucker come out? Because I comes I, I got a pre release. Comes out on February twenty seventh, which is a long ways away. Yeah. But you can order it now. It's available for pre order on the 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 Amazon monster. Um, you can order it. You can uh, surprise yourself. I've been telling people, hey, give future you a gift because you'll probably forget about it. And then yeah. all of a sudden you go out to the mailbox and oh, it'll pop up. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you should uh, through AI, you should get Snoop Dogg to do an audio version of it. That'd be, that'd be dope. <laughs> Snoop Dogg that's telling good. everybody, hey, it's going to be OK. <laughs> <laughs> he, he'd probably figure out a way of getting in there. Just just smoke one on me. <laughs> Derek, thanks, man. Hey, hey, hey um, thank e you. This yeah. has been awesome. Yeah, e even even off air, uh, man, I can't I can't thank you enough. Like it really, oh. I, I'm gonna have to read it again. It really has ministered to me, and it and it now. I mean, I would I would say I'm I'm full fledged believer. Like I can't. Mm, it, it it is the most sensical way of making sense out of the Bible, out of the world, out of the concept mm. of God of love, out of the concept of what we saw, you know, written about Jesus. Mm. It's just the most it makes the most sense. So, thanks man. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you for saying that. That you'll never know what that means to me that no, to know that people have not only read it, but that it has uh it's caused such positive things. Yeah. It's a crazy thing. Yeah, for sure. For so. sure.